Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so this is this is joint work uh, with uh, Derek Dreyer and Lars Birkedahl, um, and it's sort of following up on some work that appeared in uh, Popple this year. Um, okay, so the the general area uh, that this talk takes place within is concurrency verification, and if you've been sort of paying attention at all in recent years, you'll know that there's been a massive explosion uh, in this area with sort of new logics appearing in every conference, you know, constantly, right? And so here I've drawn sort of just the uh, most obvious descendants from separation logic, right? And already you can see quite a bit of bifurcation, right? So, so, but maybe you're not following this development so closely. So you might wonder why, you know, so many logics, what, what's sort of going on here, right? So, I mean, obviously there's, there's a lot to say about these things and I'm, I'm not gonna sort of spend time going through much of the history. Um, but generally what's been happening is uh, with each of these new logics, we're, we're able to reason about more and more sophisticated kinds of, uh, of concurrency for larger and larger programs. And the key to doing so, uh, I think, is that as you sort of go forward in time, these logics introduce new forms of modular reasoning, right? I mean, this, this is sort of the motherhood and apple pie uh, kind of statement, right? That what, what we want is modularity along every dimension possible. This is what allows us to scale up the reasoning techniques. So let me just give you some examples, right? So separation logic um, sort of introduced a very important form of modularity, namely spatial modularity, where you can reason about stuff that's going, over, going on over here in one part of the heap and know that it's not going to uh, cause problems for something going on in another location in the heap, right? So you can reason in a heap modular way. And then as you proceed to introducing concurrency, of course, you care about things like thread modularity. Then more recently, with things like abstract predicates, you deal with things like data abstraction, right? Which is one of the really basic forms of modularity in programming, right? So my claim is that sort of what's been happening with these logics is that you're seeing increased modularity and that's giving them increased power to tackle sophisticated concurrent paradigms. Okay, that's the general trend. Okay, so of course with a setup like that you sort of have to expect that what's going to come next is we're not modular enough yet, right? <laughs> so I, I want to sort of continue this line of work um, by tackling two uh, key forms of, of modularity um, that arise in programming practice that existing logics uh, can't really deal with. Okay, so, so the first one and I think the most important one um, is something that uh, we're calling granularity abstraction, which is a generalization of atomicity abstraction. Okay, and I'm gonna say much more about each of these points a bit later, but just to give you a basic idea, um, in many concurrent uh, programs, you end up using uh, libraries of concurrent data structures that interact in very sophisticated, fine-grained ways uh, for performance reasons, right? But as a client of one of these data structures, you want to think of them in a much coarser-grained way. Okay, so for example, you might think of a hash table uh, that, that you're interacting with that internally tries to allow a great amount of parallelism between threads, right? So threads writing to different hash entries don't have to synchronize at all. But as a client of this table, you'd like to imagine that every operation takes place in a single atomic step, right? So there's a difference in abstraction there, and that's a kind of modularity we want to take advantage of. Now, a, lo a lot of logics have tried to prove that this kind of abstraction holds with various degrees of success, but essentially no logic actually then lets you use this kind of abstraction to reason as a client, okay? So what I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna show you a logic today that actually allows you to both use this logic, to, uh, use this kind of abstraction to verify an algorithm and then sort of act as a client of that algorithm. Okay, another form of abstraction that I know is near and dear to many of you is functional abstraction or higher order programming. Uh, so again, in practice, you see a lot of programs that, uh, that take in functions as arguments, produce functions as results, and do so in the context of, of concurrency, right? And again, this is like largely ignored um, in, in sort of state-of-the-art logics, okay? So to make this, uh, to sort of emphasize this point about these algorithms arising in practice, right, I want to bring up a well-known concurrency library, Java Util Concurrent. Um, and .NET has sort of a, a similar uh, although somewhat smaller set of concurrency primitives, right? So Java Util Concurrent is sort of a, a dozen year long project um, uh, 
headed mostly by uh, uh, a guy named Doug Lee. Uh, and it provides a number of fine-grained, very high-performance data structures and synchroni synchronizers for concurrent programming. Okay, so these, these kinds of things, each and every one of these generally represents a paper's worth of uh, ingenuity, right, to get to perform well in, in sort of multi-core settings. So just to pick an example, right, I already mentioned hash tables. The hash tables in Java Util Concurrent allow clients to uh, read the hash table without acquiring any locks, so they can do so totally in parallel. Um, they allow clients to uh, uh, write to the hash table using fine grain locks, so if two clients are writing to different hash keys, they don't have to contend for a common lock. And then sort of most amazingly, the hash table can actually be resized while all the rest of these operations are going on, okay? So again, these are, these are the kinds of things that are very important in practice if you want to enable parallelism by building on top of these algorithms, okay? But as a client, you, don't, you shouldn't have to care about any of this stuff. You should be able to abstract away and just imagine that if I do an operation on the hash table, at some point, it'll take effect atomically. Okay, clear enough? Feel free to ask questions throughout, by the way. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, okay, so that, that was sort of, uh, that, that was the introduction. So here's, here's the plan for the talk. So the, the logic I'm telling you about today, uh, we've called Carousel. And I'm going to start um, by briefly introduc introducing sort of our uh, big picture for Carousel, which brings together two kinds of reasoning uh, that you see already in the literature. So one, horror style reasoning, which I already showed you coming out of separation logic. And the other, something called refinement which is how we tackle granularity abstraction. So I'm going to walk you through at a high level a simple example data structure and show how we unify these two modes of reasoning to support the abstraction I've, I've mentioned already. Um, then I'll show you in a bit more detail uh, how we actually carry out proofs for a data structure. And then finally, I'll talk about uh, sort of a, a major case study that we've done using this logic. OK. So here's some code. Um, Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so this is about the simplest non-trivial example of one of these fine-grained concurrent data structures I've been talking about. Okay, this is known as Triber's stack. And the idea here is, so this is, this is a, a stack that's thread safe. It can be called by concurrent clients. Okay, it supports push and pop operations, but it doesn't use a lot to protect the contents of the stack. It does something more clever. Okay. So here's, here's the basic idea. First of all, what is the representation of the stack? Well, we have a head pointer that points to some mutable list, okay? But it's in one of these so-called atomic refs. And what atomic refs uh, are basically are references that support a special operation called compare and set. Compare and set lets you safely resolve races between threads that are trying to, to uh, write to a given memory location, okay? So what we're going to do, basically, if we want to push something onto this stack, um, is follow a style of optimistic concurrency. Um, so ignore the back off here for a second. If we're trying to push, we'll allocate a new node okay, with our data in it, but we don't know exactly what the tail pointer is to start. Then we start a sort of optimistic loop to try to insert the node. So every time around the loop, we take a snapshot of the current state. Okay, this is where the optimism comes in. We haven't told any other thread that we're trying to perform an operation on the stack. We haven't acquired any locks. We've just taken a snapshot, which might be stale. Okay. Nevertheless, we use that snapshot to set up our tail pointer. And then we try to install our node. Okay. And here's the key bit. We only install the node if our snapshot is still valid. Right. So we check whether our optimistic assumption actually held up or whether some other thread interfered uh, along the way. Okay, and then in practice, you often use things like, uh, like back off uh, to make sure that you're not getting sort of too much contention over uh, central um, memory locations. But I'll, I'll sort of gloss over that point. Um, okay, so, so let me just walk through what it actually looks like to run this bit of code. All right, so here's, here's a graphical representation of an example stack. And suppose now we're trying to push a node on. So we allocate a new node with some value, and we take a snapshot of the current head, right, and set up our node to be added. But maybe behind our back, some other thread installs another node. Right? This can certainly happen because, again, we, have, we haven't signaled at all that we're trying to do a push. Okay, so some other thread might install a node, 
And now, if we updated the head pointer, we'd be in trouble. We, we would have dropped their node on the floor. Right? But that's OK, because this compare and set operation, um, oh, whoops, sorry. Uh, this compare and set operation uh, sort of makes sure that our snapshot was still valid. Right? So I, I just realized that I, I didn't actually spell out the semantics here. So what happens is we're saying we want to update the head to n if the current value is atomically cur. Okay, that's, that's the checking of the snapshot. Okay, so the point is, when we try to do the compare and set here, it's going to fail because our snapshot is not valid. And so then we'll loop again. We'll you know, get a fresh snapshot, and maybe this time we'll get lucky, and we'll win the race update head. Okay. All right, so that was a fair amount of detail, and it, it may not be clear exactly why one would ever want to program an algorithm this way. So I'm, I don't have time to sort of get into the nitty gritty um, of, of the motivation for, for this kind of algorithm, but I'll say that essentially the main reason to do this for something like a stack is cache performance. Um, that basically by avoiding a lock, we can communicate between threads using fewer cache lines, causing fewer cache misses. For other algorithms like cache tables, you also get a, a parallelism benefit, but that's hard to do for stacks. Okay? Um, and okay, so popping basically works in the same fashion. You see the same kind of optimistic re retry loop, taking a snapshot, and so on. Okay, any questions at this point? Okay, so now if we want to start to talk about verifying this kind of algorithm, right? So just you're, I'm asking you to take my word for it. That this is something that's good to do in practice, but the question is, how do you think about this as a programmer? So we need to specify the algorithm, first of all, and you might be tempted to give it a spec like this in a traditional Hoare logic fashion. Okay, so let, let me walk you through this, right? So suppose we have some stack predicate that's an abstract predicate representing the value of the stack, right? And we say, okay, well, if the stack currently has the value x's and we push x onto it, then the stack now has x const onto x's, right? Fair enough. And then similarly, if we try to pop an element off, well, maybe the stack was empty, maybe not, and we'll get a return value reflecting that and learn something, learn something about the value the stack had and also potentially update its value by removing an element. The problem is this doesn't work at all in the concurrent setting, okay? Because these predicates are not stable under interference by other threads. So basically the moment that you push an element onto a stack, nothing stops some other thread from then completely changing the value of the stack. But here we're asserting, no, the value is x const onto x's, right? Okay, so some some concurrent separation logics deal with this kind of thing by treating these assertions as sort of private assertions, meaning that no other thread could possibly be interacting with this, this stack. And that's fine, that's sound, but it defeats the purpose of using this concurrent stack in the first place, right? So, so my claim is this spec just, just won't do. Okay, clear enough? So let's try again. So here's a rather different kind of spec that really throws away quite a lot of information, but actually works, okay, in a concurrent setting. So pick any predicate P, and think of this P as being something that's satisfied by each element you put onto the stack. Okay, so the idea is you can push something onto the stack, X, if you know P of X, but now you've given up rights to P of X. So P of X might be some resource that's associated with the element, for example. If you're in separation logic, predicates have sort of associated resources with them. So you're transferring P into the stack. And then later, or transferring P of X into the stack. Later, if you pop and you get some element back, then you also learn P of X about that element. So you don't mean something like X bigger than P. Could you? Could you sure. P could be as simple as that. It could be as simple as that, absolutely. So this would say then, I don't think I push things that are bigger than P. And when I pop them, I get something that is well bigger than P. Yes. And that's. And that sound even if you're doing it concurrently, right? Because all threads have sort of agreed to follow this protocol that they'll only push elements that are bigger than three, okay? But then this resource bit is, well, maybe this element is actually a pointer. And it's a pointer to some memory whose access is sort of guarded by P. And so you're saying, I currently have ownership over this bit of memory. Now I'm gonna put it into the stack. And when some other thread gets that element back out, they have received ownership of that region of memory. Right? So these are kind of stories that we can tell on top of a data structure as a client right? that, that are saying, like, we're setting up some protocol between the threads 
that are using this data structure, passing bits of memory back and forth, or whatever this predicate is. Is that? Yeah? OK. Um, but there's an obvious problem with this spec. It's satisfied by more than just stacks, right? This is also satisfied by queues, bags, many other collections, right? So we've lost way too much information about the stack, OK? But on the other hand, we've captured some particular way that you might use the stack as a client, you know, passing in P, getting out P with elements, OK? So also unsatisfactory, but somewhat better. Here's a rather different way we might specify a stack, OK? As a piece of code, right? So here is the trivial way to make a stack or any uh, sequential data structure thread safe. You just wrap every operation with essentially a lock, right? So I think synchronized keyword in Java here. Okay, so basically, we're just using the sequential implementation and forcing mutual exclusion between the operations. Okay, so this is a specification that loses no information, I claim, about the operation of the stack, um, works in a concurrent setting, right? Uh, and that gives us something reasonable to work with as a client, right? So now, when we think about push, we get a, a nice simple atomic operation instead of that retry loop that we saw before. So in this particular case, okay, but other cases might have deadlock if you wrap the central things, if they call other concurrent operations. Yes, indeed. Um, so, so if the implementation of the retry pop called something else, which ends up calling push or something. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, so if you're going to do this kind of thing, you probably want a sort of specification language that you know, actually has some atomic keyword, for instance, um, you know, that, maybe that, that avoids deadlock. Although there are some problems with, with the higher order case. I, sort of, I don't want to get into that too much at the moment. It's, but not, imme oh, I'm sorry, it's not immediately obvious that this could, you could turn this into a straightforward specification language, unless you set up a very simple operation like this. Yeah. Um, right, I think, so I would say that for most of the data structures of interest in something like Java Util Concurrent, you're not getting that kind of reentrancy, right? Yeah. yeah. But it, it's a fair point, okay? So, so, so we're going to take something like a mixture of the approaches that I've shown you uh, in Carousel, okay? So first of all, um, this last specification I showed you is the key to doing granularity abstraction, right? So we have some implementation of a data structure that where threads are interacting at a very fine grain doing things like compare and set. And then we have a simple coarse grain spec. And the idea is that uh, we want to say that no client that's, plug that's linked against the fine grained implementation can tell the difference from the coarse grain spec. That will be our correctness criterion for something like a stack. Okay, so, so in other words, you run with the fast thing and you reason with the easy thing. Then, you can connect that kind of granularity abstraction with a kind of whore style spec uh, that I mentioned earlier. Okay? So as a client of something like the stack, right, maybe you don't actually care that it's a stack. Maybe you're layering some protocol like the bag protocol that I showed you, and that's really what you want to reason with. Okay? But Carousel supports this kind of decomposition of the proof because the bag spec isn't the only spec that you might imagine associating with this stack. right? it loses a great deal of information, yet you don't want to reprove things from the Triber stack every time, right? In general, this could be a very complicated algorithm, right? So in Carousel, what we do is we sort of cut this down the middle using granularity abstraction, let you prove some sort of canonical specification for the data structure in terms of other code, and then further abstract that to, say, horse-style specs as, as you wish, right, without having to sort of reprove things from scratch. Sure. So, so for stacks, for in the concurrent thing, it's not. Uh, and if other people can mess with the stack, yes, it's not obvious what you can say about. You know, you push three in. Well, can I get three out? No, somebody might have taken it out. Yeah, yeah. So, so stacks, um, stacks, are, you know, support a nice simple implementation. So I use it as an example here. They're not so useful in a in a concurrent setting. So a better example is something like a hash table, and. Uh, so there are you know, many uh, parallel algorithms that use hash tables internally um, to control some kind of protocol between threads. So your knowledge there might be, uh, for example, that um, all the rights to a certain key uh, 
are sort of monotonically increasing over time or something like that. Right? So you might You mean that's that's the specification of the hash table. You that's the abstract, right? So so you have a canonical a, a simple atomic version of the hash table. And then as a user of that hash table, right, you have to somehow you you have threads that are interacting through it according to some higher level protocol. Something like values are monotonically increasing or, you know, things along that line. I mean, I could get, yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that does that sort of make sense? You might have. And then that, uh, then that, oh, okay. then it would be the satisfied thing. Okay. Yeah. Is there a semantic difference between defining and satisfying? Is there, sorry, a semantic difference? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> yes, uh, well, so, so I'm not quite sh Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, Yes, uh, so, so this, this semantically is a contextual refinement, sort of like I alluded to earlier, where you say no client can tell the difference, right? right? Whereas this is just standard HOR triple satisfaction that doesn't explicitly talk about, uh, about the clients. Uh, you know, it's not a refinement property. Yes? Um, I don't see how. Oh, 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 I see. Yes, you could turn the horse, horse satisfaction into a refinement. Yes, yeah. So, so specification statements basically internalize pre and post conditions in, into a language construct. And if you did that, then you could work completely with refinement. And that's, that's a perfectly reasonable way to go if you're willing to sort of change the language. Right. Yeah. Any other questions at this point? Okay, so, so again, the point is just that different clients of a data structure that are using it concurrently impose different kinds of protocols on their use, but we don't want to have to reprove the fine-grained version ev for each different protocol. Okay, that's that's the point. So we're using granularity abstraction to to factor this proof into two steps. Okay, that was granularity abstraction. The other kind of abstraction I, I mentioned was functional abstraction. All right. So suppose we extend the stack I showed you earlier with an iteration construct, okay, which just takes in some function and applies it to every element of the stack. Okay? That sounds simple enough. If you read this as sequential code, it, it probably looks like what you're used to. Okay? But in fact, this is quite subtle because as you're walking through this list, the stack itself could be changing underfoot. Right? There are no locks here, so nothing prevents other threads from mucking about with the actual contents of the stack. So you really did one get, right? You just grabbed the you threw a snapshot and you worked on the snapshot. It, yes, indeed. So there's no de it doesn't matter if the stack's changing. If that's water under the hood, you've just got a value with that head dot get, haven't you? Well, so notice that first of all, uh, okay, so I, I take your point. Um, but the the question is, as a client again of of this method, what connection, if any, do you have between the elements that you see? And the current value of the stack, the current elements of the stack. If someone comes, just make so in general, none, right? No, but no. you say head dot get, and then you go to sleep, and anything like that. Exactly, right? Um, but of course, so again, the story is uh, we need so we need some specification that basically captures that idea, but then that allows clients that are better behaved, right? So in general, if if there are arbitrary threads out there, they could be mutating the stack in some unknown way. But that's not how we program, right? We know what the other threads are. We wrote them. They're following some protocol and interacting in a certain way. And so we want, it, we want something that we can use to get more predictive power about what elements we'll see. Okay? Um, yeah. Is it enough that when you say mutable list of A here in this loop, I mean, it's really, it's not expect, you're not expecting those cells to be I'm, I'm not. However, the type was important because. Uh, it's only that atomic ref thing. That's the mutable thing. Uh, so there was actually another source of mutation already. Uh, it's a bit subtle, but when we push the elements on, right, we allocate this node and we sat there and kept mutating its tail yeah. until we finally put it in. Yeah, but by the time it got to be plugged into the, into the atomic ref, it was fixed. Yes. Yeah. But we need to be able to actually prove that in, yeah, yeah. in the logic, so right? The idea is Kerr has type mutable. Yes. Logically, 
So you've set me up very nicely, actually. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm going to skip over this because we kind of already talked through it um, and show you the, the atomic specification for the stack. And notice that, in fact, I've, I changed the type of the list here to be immutable. So when you're programming against this spec, you get exactly uh, sort of what we had in mind that, look, you, you read the head, which is an immutable value, and then you loop over it, and that's all you know. And there's a priori no connection between the elements you see and the current value of the head. Okay. But again, this is just sort of the canonical atomic spec that works for any concurrent client. But in general, we're going to impose some protocol that say our threads are better behaved than that. They're, you know, they're not going to pop arbitrarily. There's some logic to what they're doing with this stack. OK? Fair enough? OK. So that, that was the overall picture of how we want to deal with higher order abstraction and granularity abstraction um, to sort of modularize reasoning in, in a way that hasn't been done before. OK? I, I lost the higher order bit there. So the algorithm, so, so the, 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 the F. Yes. Yes, OK, so, so it is true you know, this was uh, not a very interesting example of higher order programming. Um, so I have two things to say about that. One, the, the case study I'll show later is a more interesting example. And two, uh, existing logics just can't, don't scale to higher order code at all, even, even simple cases like this. So there was a lot of work just in building a semantic model that could support even this simple form of higher order. Okay? But the claim is that higher order programming is really important in practice, so we, we need to be able to handle it, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so so that, that was sort of the high level picture of what we're trying to, yes? Just, just for fun, so I mean, is higher order programming important in practice? Yes. Presumably you have a counter example, so someone who says it's not. <laughs> yes, indeed. Of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know it is to you. <laughs> yeah, so. so Ab absolutely. So I mean, so al again, although it was a somewhat trivial case, this kind of iterator thing is used all over the place in object-oriented programming. And Java Util Concurrent has hash tables with iterators like this. Um, and you know, it's absolutely essential to, to programming up sophisticated algorithms. Like, so the work I did with Claudio, for instance, on join patterns actually uses this kind of iterator. Um, but again, I'll, I'll, I'll get to at the end here this other algorithm that's sort of more interesting, right? And is used in practice. OK. Any more questions before I go on? Uh, okay, so for the next uh, part of the talk, I, I want to delve a bit into the detail um, of how we actually prove uh, these refinements that I was talking about, actually prove a granularity abstraction. Um, okay, so the way we do this um, is by introducing what we call protocols, okay, very general term. Protocols are meant just to capture so, um, sort of the expectations about a bit of state that's hidden but shared between some number of threads. Okay? For example, the representation of the Triber stack that threads are interacting with. And to model these protocols, we started with um, uh, a recent sort of the state of the art uh, logical relation um, work um, from ICFP 10, which showed in the sequential setting how to use a kind of transition system to explain the evolution of hidden state. Okay? It turns out this is a very natural fit for concurrency, but to scale it up, you need to add a few uh, sort of features to the, the basic transition system model. Okay? And I'm not, I'm not going to be able to cover all of these today, of course, um, but just to give you a flavor, basically the extensions align with certain kinds of locality or like the modular reasoning that I was talking about before. Um, so for today, I'm going to focus just on thread, lo thread locality aspects. Um, and I'll, I'll explain uh, sort of what, what these terms mean as we go along. So first of all, what, what does a protocol look like? So here's like the simplest imaginable example for concurrency. So if you have a lock, right, you can think of that as basically a bit with two states that can cycle arbitrarily right, between locked and unlocked. So what we do is we, we write down a protocol as a state transition system where the, the states themselves are sort of abstract names that we can, we can pick as we like, but they're interpreted as assertions about the heap under, under the hood. So in the unlock state, for example, we say that the lock itself is false. That's how we're representing unlock. And that in addition, there's some resource that's protected by the lock, right? that's sort of owned by the lock. On the other hand, in the lock state, the lock is true and the resource has disappeared. Okay? So the idea is when you take this transition, 
you get control over this resource R, you being some thread that actually acquires the lock. And then similarly, when you unlock, you have to have re-satisfied this invariant R, and you give back up ownership to the, to the lock. Okay? So if you've seen concurrent separation logic, this should be pretty familiar stuff. Okay? So, but there's a slight problem, um, at least if we look at this abstract level, in that the, the way we read this protocol is basically, you know, I might know that the current heap satisfies the unlock state. My environment is allowed to take any transition it likes at any time. And so if you have a cyclic transition system like this, you really don't know much at all. about It's not constraining interference much at all, right? So if I think it's in the unlock state, it could be in the, in the lock state and vice versa. But in reality, what we want is to say that only the thread, for example, that acquires the lock is allowed to actually then release the lock. Some other thread in its environment can't release the lock on its behalf. That's a, at least an example protocol for a lock. Do that sort of hand over hand thing, right? Yeah, you could do something more complicated. Okay, okay and, and the, this protocol you know, system will sort of support that kind of thing. But just as a simple motivating example, suppose we wanted to encode this. So the way we do this is, is via sort of abstract permissions that show up in the protocol, so which we call tokens. And tokens represent a way for threads to take on roles in a protocol by taking certain transitions. Okay, so this token you can think of as representing the lock. And again, there's a kind of conservation property where the thread that takes this step gets ownership of this token. And then only a thread that owns this token can take the step from locked to unlocked. So let me, let me walk through that in a bit more detail. Right, so the idea is, if you want to go from the unlock to lock state, you start by not owning any tokens, and the protocol has the token. And then in the end, the protocol doesn't claim the token. So sort of by conservation, you must have the token now. And then vice versa, if you own the token and want to unlock, that's fine, because here the protocol is claiming it. You have to give it up, but you, you had it at the beginning, so everything's kosher. But if some other thread who doesn't own the token tries to move you from the locked to unlocked state, it won't be able to satisfy this equation, right? The protocol says, you have to give me the token. The other thread doesn't have the token, so it can't make this, the move. Right. Yeah? But don't we already do that with these R's? I mean, we do the same sort of thing, so it seems like I mean, the R is already kind of playing this double role that Uh, yes, yeah, so, so the idea is that, um, okay, so it's true for this particular example that if you sort of cook up the right kind of R, you can, you've already ruled out uh, this kind of move. But you know, for more sophisticated locking protocols, I could hand some other thread, the lock for example, uh, and it could unlock on my behalf, and you want to be able to, mod to model that in, you know, using these protocols. I mean, but the, the sort of more general answer is um, it's useful to be able to talk about what threads are allowed to do completely at this abstract level of the state transition system without reference to the underlying uh, resources in their interpretation. Okay, so you set up a protocol using these tokens. That tells you how things are allowed to evolve in general. And then in any given state, you can see sort of what the state of the heap is under the hood. Uh, yes, yes, in general. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, there's sort of a horde logic where tokens work as any other kind of resource. Yes, yes, absolutely, yep. So you, you can have only one maximum unique diamond token. I mean, is there, if there is, are more, more tokens, then other threads may have that token, so you assume that the tokens are unique, so in any instance. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, yeah, you could do something more complicated, but generally we say that there's some set of tokens, mm -hmm. and each token is sort of unique and can be owned by only one thread at a time. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, do you mean formally or, I mean, so spiritually, yes. Yeah, I mean, in effect, you're giving a system that lets you define the stuff that would map down onto monoids. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and in the long run, that's, that's where we want to go. I mean, we've modeled the, well, I, let me take that offline, but we should talk more about it after, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so that's, that's a, just a, a relatively simple um, extension to the basic transition system model. And again, the point is, all threads share a central protocol, but threads have different views on it by virtue of the tokens that they own. OK, clear enough? Uh, OK, so 
Then the other uh, extension that we need to handle uh, thread locality uh, is something that we call specification resources. Uh, so to motivate this, I want to give you another example algorithm um, that builds on top of the stacks I showed you earlier. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Are you, you see what I'm asking? No. <laughs> so, right at the beginning, you said there's this whole split, and because it's wide tree. Yes. Right? And I want one way of doing just adding to something, right? Thread modularity, and then, you know, key modularity, and thread modularity, and so on, right? But so, yeah, your protocols are disjoint, separate from each other. I think you're reading too much into this picture. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I guess, so the, the point I was trying to make in the beginning is just that um, this progression of logics has been sort of introducing new axes of modularity. And I'm just trying to take the next step. Yeah. You know, nothing more than that. Yeah. OK. Uh, OK. So, so, I'm gonna, so I want to take uh, one more look at, at stacks here um, and think a bit more abstractly about what's going on. Right? So say, say we have a stack like so. And then we have four concurrent threads that all try to do operations on it at once, okay, like, like so. Now, what the um, atomic specification that I showed you guarantees is that these operations will take effect in some sequence. Okay? It's a non-deterministic interleaving, but each one atomically modifies the value of the stack. Right? That's, that's sort of the basic view of, 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 um, of a concurrent stack. Uh, but it turns out that we can make a very clever observation about stacks in particular that allows us to parallelize access to stacks right, by observing when we have this kind of concurrency. So this is an algorithm known as elimination stacks. And the idea is very simple. You can notice that certain operations on stacks, like pushes and pops, cancel each other out. Right? If I do this, if I choose a sequencing where first I push three and then I pop, the stack stays the same. And all that's happened really is that I've passed this value 3 from the pushing thread to the popping thread. Okay? So this is a very interesting observation because it allows us to do two things to the stack. Number one, it means that we can service these operations from these other threads without having to modify this single point of contention, this single head pointer. Um, and also, it means that we can communicate uh, operations between threads in parallel. Right? I mean, that's sort of a, another way of saying the same thing. Right? So let me show you what this looks like concretely. Um, so the elimination stack has sort of two parts to its representation, some underlying stack, like the Triber stack, and then a side channel for threads to discover each other and try to cancel their operations out. Okay? So then the idea is, if you're a thread that's trying to do a push, you now have two choices. You could attempt to do the push on the, on the real stack, or you could advertise your intent to push and hope that some other thread is trying to pop at the same time. So suppose we choose the latter. We make our offer. And then we, we wait for a moment to see whether some popper happens to come along. Likewise, the popping thread now can notice that there's an offer in play to push this value and accept the offer. Okay? So at this point, we've transferred the value 3 from the pusher to the popper without ever modifying the underlying stack. Right? And so it, if you imagine now you actually have some table of channels, you can actually support parallel eliminations of pushes against pops and, again, eliminate this contention on the central stack resource. Okay? And stacks are just one simple example of, of this kind of phenomenon of threads helping each other out uh, to do operations on some underlying data structure. Indeed. So you, know, you have to carefully design this in a sort of heuristic style uh, to try to figure out how active this data structure is. Uh, and they do sort of an exponential back off in terms of use, using the table. Right? But semantically, I mean, the way this works is you make an offer, you wait around for a limited amount of time, but n there's no guarantee that some opposite thread is going to come along. So after a while, you give up and try to modify the underlying stack. Right? Oh, sorry. Yeah. You're saying that guys on processor number three would access element number three. No, no, I'm not saying that at all. Um, what they look through the table, 
No, I, well, th so this is what, so I, you know. So the hunt for. Uh, there are many strategies you could use, right? So my point is just that in, in practice with this algorithm, they use a kind of heuristic strategy that's based on uh, exponential, um, an exponential distribution, right? So essentially, you start with the first element, and if there's somebody already there, then you sort of assume, oh, there's, there's a lot of activity on this, and you sort of double each time how far into the table you're willing to look. Right, so it's it's a bit complicated, right? But you can choose any strategy you like. Okay. Okay. So, as it turns out, right? So so this kind of algorithm again is is something. Uh, I mean, there's there there are many algorithms out there in practice that use this kind of helping between threads. But to actually verify these algorithms is quite difficult if you're trying to do thread modular reasoning. Okay, and the reason is generally, if you want to show that say the Triber version of push satisfies its specification, the atomic version of push, you have a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence, right? My push implementation corresponds to one invocation of the push specification. The problem here is that when the popper accepts an offer from the pusher, semantically it's doing both the push and the pop at the same time. Those two have to be sequenced adjacently for this to make any sense. And that breaks the kind of one-to-one -one correspondence that we had generally. Okay, so to deal with this, we introduce specification code as another kind of resource that you get uh, in, in the logic. And I'll, I'll show you what that, that looks like as we go along here. Uh, but basically, this is going to allow a thread to give up access to its spec code to some other thread that can do an operation on its behalf, and then later get that code back. Okay? Uh, okay, so... To actually walk you through this, I'm going to simplify a bit further. Let's forget stacks and just think about an even simpler case of flags. Okay? Because if you negate a flag twice, it's the same as doing nothing. So two, two knots can sort of discover each other and cancel, cancel themselves out. Okay? So th the specification is very simple. We have a Boolean value. We have two operations. You can read the current value and you can negate it. Fair enough? All, all of these happen atomically. So that's what we're trying to implement. Now, I'm not going to show you the implementation straight off. It's a bit complicated. I'm going to start by showing you a protocol that explains sort of the essential idea. So the implementation, in addition to having a flag, has a side channel, just like with the elimination stack. And the side channel takes on three values. Either it's empty, so the, the value is 0. Some thread is trying to do a negation, so there's an offer on the table. Um, or some thread has acknowledged the existing offer. Okay. And then the original thread sort of cancels this out. So there's a use of tokens here, which basically tells you that only the thread that made the original author and thereby gained the token is allowed to sort of clear out the channel from 2 back to 0. OK, why is that important? Well, there's another bit to the protocol, and this is the specification resources. So suppose I'm executing one of these negations. And I have some corresponding specification thread. Let's say its ID is J. And it's trying to perform the corresponding flip operation. When I make this move to the offered state, the protocol demands, semantically, that I give up the right to my specification. I share it. Okay? Now, some other thread is allowed to take this step. Right? There, there's, there are no tokens involved in going from here to here. But if, that, if some other thread takes that step, it's obligated to execute the flip operation, right? Leaving just a unit behind. And then only I, who originally made the offer, am able to regain control of this specification resource. So in other words, I share it temporarily, but then I'm the only thread that can get it back later on. OK? So now let's walk through this again, but actually looking at the code. All right, so, so this is a, you know, I've, I've tried to simplify this example as much as possible. So it looks a bit strange, but bear with me. Um, OK, so basically, here's how, here's how the algorithm works in detail. First, we try to do an honest flip of the flag, right? So we guess, hey, maybe the flag is true. Let's flip it to false. OK, notice we started here with ownership of one instance of the flipping spec, right? That corresponds to our flipping implementation here, OK? So, if that compare and set succeeds, everything is fine, right? We just execute 
our specification to match up that action, right? We flip the flag on the implementation side, and so we run the spec to keep things in sync. No problem. Okay, same thing, we can try an honest flip going in the other direction. If we succeed, no problem. But if neither of these two things succeed, then we try to use the elimination flag. Uh, um, that would work too. It's yeah, either either way is fine. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's equally good. So we only need one cas. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is right. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So another. So so if we fail to sort of do an honest flip, then we can try using the side channel to uh, eliminate some other flip that's out there. Okay. So uh, you can actually do these things in basically an arbitrary order. So here we're going to choose to guess that there's currently an offer on the table and we're going to accept that offer right by casting the channel from one to two so this will succeed only if the protocol is currently in the offered state right in which case there's this resource here the other guy's specification the thread that made the author right notice we have our specification at thread id i and there's their specification at thread id j so if this succeeds um, then we gain access to their specification, at which point we can execute both flips back to back. And that's perfect because the effect of executing two flips is nothing, no change. And indeed, we haven't changed the flag at all here. We're about to return unit without having touched the implementation flag. Right? So we're maintaining sort of um, synchronization between what's happening in the implementation and the spec but we don't have this one-to-one -one relationship between implementation flips and spec flips. Okay? So I'm used to thinking of these resources as things like heap address points to something. Like yes. Now, now it's these you know, strange I things point to some bits of code. Yeah. Uh, My brain is melting at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems if you hijack the notation for something entirely different. Yeah, so, so in fact, um, this started happening quite early in... Uh, sort of it, that initial diagram I showed of the family tree of separation logics. Oh, okay. This is kind of old news oh, in a sense oh, of coming up with new notions of resource that generalize beyond just the concrete heap, um, right? So indeed, I am introducing a particular new notion of resource, which is specification resources, but it's sort of all par for the course for, for separation logics these days. So what can I say? <laughs> Um, okay, so I think for the sake of time, I'm, I'm going to skip uh, the rest of this example. I think I, I've showed sort of the, the key bit um, of actually uh, accepting, um, accepting an offer to flip. I want to move on. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about then, um, right, I've shown you in some detail, right, some very simple examples. Um, but you know, all this stuff is only interesting if you can actually scale it up to deal with some real interesting examples. Okay. So, uh, so we've actually applied our logic to um, a pretty sophisticated algorithm called flat combining. And so I'm going to start by first explaining the specification for this algorithm, and then I'll give you the key idea for it. Okay. And, and flat combining is a higher order uh, algorithm in particular. So the idea is basically a lot like STM, we take in some, uh, some sequential piece of code, F, okay? and you should think, think of this as representing basically an object with some method. You could generalize it to multiple methods, it, it doesn't really matter, that does some you know, sequential update to some internal state. What we want out of this algorithm is something that behaves sequentially just like that original function, but that guarantees mutual exclusion between invocations, right? So this is basically the same kind of thing that STM is, is meant to do, okay? So if we wanted to give that specification more formally, we can write down a piece of code and use refinement, right? So what is the specification? Well, we can introduce a global lock that guarantees mutual exclusion. And so the wrapped version of the operation just acquires the lock, does the sequential operation, and releases it just like you'd expect, right? So this is, this is a, a specification for Atomicity, right, or for something like STM. Okay. Yes. So syncf is not equal to syncf. It, 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 it's, yes, it, it's a side-affecting language. 
not quite the same as the topic then. I mean, if I write a topic, I might, I might yeah. to write, expect to be able to write a topic in more than one place. And yes. That's true, but this, this is not, that's not the case. It's sort of generative right, I get. Yes. Um, and so this actually captures, so I, I don't want to get too much into this, but there, uh, there's a distinction between so-called strong atomicity and weak atomicity. And it exactly comes down to this, this kind of generativity. Um, so strong atomicity is very difficult to implement efficiently, but weak atomicity is, is much easier. So, but in practice, the point is, you know, you, you have some library, like, again, say a hash table you've got a good implementation of. You apply this wrapper once, and now you have a new, I mean, it's kind of like a functor. Now you have a new synchronized hash table, right? Clear enough? OK. Uh, OK, so what's the idea for flat combining? Right, so, so we're going to attack this problem in a way that's rather different from how uh, STM implementations do it. Basically, we're going to keep around a kind of global lock, but it's going to play a very different role from the one I just showed you. So here, the lock is going to mediate cooperation between threads, kind of like with the elimination stack. And the idea is, is basically that if a data structure is hard to parallelize, then give up on parallelization and focus on cache performance. OK, that's, that's, it, it, it's surprising, actually, how well this works in practice for things like stacks or priority queues, or, you know, where there uh, tends to be a great deal of contention over uh, you know, a fixed location in memory. Um, so what, what we're going to do is essentially have one thread become the combiner that does a bunch of work on behalf of the other threads that are trying to operate on the data structure. Um, and this is good for cache performance uh, because that combining thread pulls a bunch of the data structure into its local cache and performs a bunch of operations in sequence with everything in, in cache, right? As we'll see, it also, this algorithm also sort of cuts down on the synchronization between threads that's necessary. So, okay, so I'm just going to give you a, a very high-level picture um, of the algorithm. Basically, the representation has two parts. We have this combiner lock that I mentioned before. And then we have a, a, a list of subscribing threads. So basically, the idea is when... Um, uh, when a thread wants to use this algorithm, the first time it does so, it'll add itself to the list of subscribers. Excuse me, the stack of subscribers. What does that mean? Well, it adds a subscriber record, which at all times takes on one of two different values, either a request or a response. Okay, so the idea is a thread is advertising that it's trying to perform an operation on this data structure with argument x, and then later the combiner can respond with some answer y. And what, what we're going to try to do, again, is have one thread execute many operations on behalf of others with minimal synchronization. Okay? Now, one key thing is that this subscriber stack can change concurrently while, uh, while the uh, combiner is actually doing its work. Right? So we're not using this lock to protect access to the stack. In fact, we're using a lock-free stack. Right? So this is all changing underfoot. We're just using this lock to make sure only one thread is acting as the combiner at a time. So, so, um, so, so generally, you don't want to pop elements. So, okay, pushing onto the subscriber stack is going to take a compare and set, right? So, you want to pay that synchronization cost only once up front, and then you keep your record around. You reuse that same record for as long as you're interested in, in the data structure. You don't mean once per push, you mean once per once, subscriber. Once per subscriber, that's right. Then the I'm point is... Who's interested in the stack, I subscribe, and then I somehow use that to my... Exactly, and, and the reason this is so important is once you have your subscriber record in the stack, mm -hmm. then you can just do a normal write, no, no compare and set uh, to make a request, because this is your record. No other thread is going to make requests on your record, right? And then the combiner will at some point perhaps notice that this request is there and service it, OK? OK, but of course, some thread needs to become the, the combiner. So, ba so the general algorithm is you know, after you've added yourself to the, to the stack and you've made your request, um, you can you sort of check the combiner lock, see whether some thread is currently combining. If it's not, you try to become the combiner. And otherwise, you wait around for the combiner to do the operation on your behalf. Busy, busy wait, indeed. Um, and as you're doing so, you need to keep an eye on the combiner lock because there's, there's a race condition here, right? That you might have appeared just as the combiner was finishing, right? Make sense? Okay, 
So, so again, it's a bit weird if you're not familiar with these kinds of algorithms, but the whole point of this is we're trying to minimize um, uh, cache misses sort of across the board, minimize use of op operations like compare and set. Okay? Um, uh, all right, so I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to very briefly um, you know, sort of show you how we capture uh, the idea of this algorithm as a protocol. So we have one global protocol, similar to the one I showed you before, for governing the combiner lock. Then we have a subscriber record protocol that governs each subscriber record independently. Right? So we have one copy of this protocol per record. The bottom state means the record hasn't been created yet, basically. So when you first create the record, you do so by making a request. And you say, I have some spec thread J that's trying to perform that request. And just like before with elimination stacks, you have to give up your give up the right to that specification. Then the combiner can actually move to the execution state and gain access to your spec resource. Okay? So I've annotated these edges with the tokens that are required to actually make, make the move. Okay, so so the point is and, and I should say this this L annotation is uh, represents the thread that actually owns the subscriber record. So only that thread is allowed to make those moves. Okay? So the, sub, the, the thread trying to do an operation is allowed to request it. The combiner is allowed to perform it. And then the thread trying to do the operation is able to acknowledge it and take back ownership of the spec, just like in the elimination flag uh, example I showed before. Okay, so that at a high level, that's, that's how we can deal with uh, the flat combining protocol. But then, um, you know, I sort of mentioned in passing that we're using Triber's stack internally in this data structure. So I just want to now take a step back and say how, modular, how the modularity of Carousel um, sort of enables us to factor this proof. Right? So I showed you before how Triber's stack refines some atomic spec, which we can abstract using something like a bag. And that's exactly what we do here. We don't actually care about the order of the subscriber records. We just want to know that when we iterate over them, there's something that's true about each of those records, namely that it's participating in the protocol I just showed you. Okay? And then in actually um, proving this satisfaction, we use a couple of other data structures. right? So we, use, we, we need to reason about the lock that's present in this atomic stack. We do so using core style reasoning. And we need to reason about lists right, that we're using for iteration, which again, we do so using horse style reasoning. So we use horse style reasoning um, in, in proving this satisfaction. And then we use all of this stuff in actually proving the refinement at the end of the day. Okay? So even if you don't understand all these details, the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, we can freely mix these two modes of reasoning, refinement and satisfaction, and build up a modular proof that matches the modular data structure um, that, that we developed. Okay? I'm going to skip that little footnote for the sake of time. Uh, okay. Uh, so, th so we've covered uh, sort of the three aspects of the talk. So now let me just make a couple concluding remarks. Um, so flat combining is not the only interesting algorithm we've studied. Um, we've looked at a number of uh, common lock-free data structures that are actively used in practice um, and, and done fully formal proofs um, of these data structures. And here, just uh, sort of... Uh, machine supported. I'm sorry? As in machine supported. No, no, no. Uh, so, yes, but I mean, yeah. So uh, it's in comparison to, each, you know, each of these papers contains a proof of correctness that's not formal at all, right? And so what we've done is actually on paper done a, a complete proof in a program logic. Yep. Um, okay, so that's just to give you an indication of, of where we are um, with Carousel. And where we'd like to go, well, we want to keep sort of this forward march of, of modularity that I showed you at the beginning. We want to scale this up further to reason about more interesting higher order uh, um, uh, concurrency programming. So if you're familiar with, uh, for example, John Reppy's concurrent ML, that's very close to a monadic interface to concurrent programming. And right now, essentially, no logic is able to scale up to, to actually reason about uh, this style of programming. Right? So now that we can tackle higher order, we have some hope of doing this. But there are a lot of problems uh, to address before we can go all the way. Um, also, uh, so I focused um, only on safety properties. We'd like to tackle liveness as well. Um, and there are some actually very interesting problems in the model theory to make this work. And then also, of course, uh, 
you know, I'm sort of surprised I didn't get this question. So the uh, memory model that we're using here is sequentially consistent, and that's an increasingly sort of questionable thing to do, but essentially all program logics at the moment uh, you know, work at that level, although you know, there are some sort of forthcoming proposals for doing better. So we'd also like uh, to reason about relaxed memory um, with, our, with our logic eventually. Okay, so just to sum up, so carousel is a logic that supports two modes, two new modes of modularity, uh, granularity abstraction and higher order functions. And it does this by bringing together refinement and horse style reasoning. So thank you very much. Mm. Excuse me? Oh, concurrent and refined separation logic. Oh, the A is for ant. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, so here, refinement in your example was just essentially proving linearizability. Uh, yeah, yeah I, they're related. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can think of, it's fair to think of it that way. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, but formally speaking, they are two different properties, so one would need to prove that they're equivalent, um, which they are in certain languages, but not all. Yes? Do you have great hopes that this will work for relaxed memory models? Uh, yes, I'm optimistic. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think, so, what I, okay, but more seriously. Um, so one thing that is actually uh, really surprising to me about um, the framework that we've been using of logical relations is how orthogonal the different components are. So like scaling to higher order, we really didn't have to say anything specific about the interaction between that and concurrency. It just kind of fell out. So my hope is that um, we'll be able to change the memory model without having to change you know, much of the sort of uh, general supporting framework of logical relations. But, um, but it's really early days. I mean, I, I haven't really started looking at that in detail. Um, that, it's certainly possible to do things that way. So there's already, so um, in uh, this year's Popple, there was a paper about library abstraction um, for weak memory, for C11 in particular. And basically they were advocating exactly this kind of refinement as a way of specifying weak memory data structures. Okay, um, but whether in the long run that's sort of a sustainable way to go is, is unclear. Um, right, there, I mean, there are some problems with specifying code by writing more code Right, so another approach would be to increase the power of your specification language, right, so that you can say you can talk about atomicity directly, but without having to actually write code that that just is that you think is obviously atomic, right? 